Okay. Hey, everyone. So thank you very much for joining us today in the, I think this is the eighth session of the, the Foundry program. This is probably one of my favorites out of all of the things we talk about um, at the uh, at the Foundry courses. Um, yeah, it's about mechanism design, which is, let me hide this, the art and science of essentially programming human behavior. As scary as that sounds, and I, I think it is scary. Uh, Seb, would you mind just checking for me that, that you can see and hear me? Perfect. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yes, so programming human behavior, which is, I would say, approximately as scary as it sounds. It's one of the, um, one of the interesting innovations allowable by uh, trust-related, and, and what would you say? Yeah, trust-related technology like blockchains, or led primarily by blockchains, really, and the decentralized networks around them, allows you to program money. And if you can program the way that money moves inside systems, you can program the incentive systems behind that money. And that, because humans respond to incentives in ways that we'll describe in this lecture, essentially allows you to program the behavior of humans at, at large scale. But I would say the first thing is to, to define the goal here. So we would say we want to write applications, and, and this is from an engineering perspective. You want to be able to write applications that execute on crowds of humans reaching an intended goal. But more critically, we want to be ethical about doing that. I would say that the mechanism design space is light to low, <laughs> light to low to no regulation, depending on where you are in the world. And uh, the way that it's seen by the, or, or these tokens are seen by local um, governments. And so I think that it's important as an industry, we, we take seriously the ethical effects of the things that can be built in this area. So we'll be talking about that too. So first theory, then ethics, and then we're gonna be talking through the process of how you can create mechanism designs in the wild. Like what do you actually need to do in order to coherently and correctly address these, um, I guess, problems? Um, or, or opportunities, if that's where you want to look at it, um, to, to achieve the right kind of ends. So first, the theory. We're going to start with a very, very zoomed out perspective on what our new kind of machine type, if you will, that is of the human and the crowd is. So each individual in a crowd is unique, right? They, you don't know anything about that person, more or less, and you can't truly predict their behavior. However, what is predictable is the general behavior of large numbers of people when put in different um, situations and, and exposed to different incentives. So one way to model this in, in your head is to think about the likelihood of activation of an individual by a mechanism or by an incentive system is you know, some probability, maybe it's 80%, maybe it's 20%. Um, but that really, so, so at an individual level, you can't tell what that individual will do, but you can say that you know, given 5,000 people or 10,000 people, 10,000, um, then you can get uh, 2,000 activations of the mechanism from a group of 10,000 people. And you can know that relatively predictably, relatively clearly. That's something that is um, repeatable enough that you can depend upon it uh, as part of a program that you're building. So on inside each of those individuals, there are base instincts and desires that create goals. These are, you know, we would call them sort of, uh, how would you describe it? Yeah, I mean, they're the basic components of living. It, everybody wants to eat, sleep, stay hydrated, uh, procreate, protect themselves and their family and, and their society at a larger scale and so on. These are all of the basic desires that make up humans. They're actually probably, um, at least it seems like, a priori programmed instincts in humans to pursue these goals. And, and they're essentially expressed in Maslow's hierarchy of needs very effectively. So first, at the base level, the most important stuff is the physiological needs, then safety needs, love and belonging, self-esteem, or, or rather esteem in general, um, and then self-actualization. These are the basic goals of life. These are the things that almost every person becomes pre-programmed with. They will want to pursue these things no matter who they are in the world. Our bodies create rewards and punishments, which are essentially our brain actually creates rewards and punishment when we interact with these goals. These give rise to the basic incentives of living. And so, 
you can see that when your brain is and hungry, it makes a plan to get towards the goal where you eat some food and you satiate the desire. So there's a kind of basic instinct, uh, an incentive to eat that is baked into us. And then we create uh, plans in order to get towards solving um, our problems or, or at least fulfilling the needs that we have. And so you can kind of see it like this. Human wants to get towards goal, creates a plan. In order to achieve the goal, the brain creates sub goals to enable incremental progress. So you can't possibly um, say, I want to go home and I want to eat a steak, right? I want, I'm hungry, you know, I want shelter, and I want to eat good food. These are my kind of base incentives right now. Um, in order to make a plan for how to get that done at the, the, the global level, it's just too much. There's too much complexity. So what you'll notice brains do all the time is they create sub goals along the way. Um, I'll say, OK, well, I need to get some money first and then I need to go to a shop and then I need to buy the steak and then I need to go home, which I guess also requires a sub goal of having a home. And then I need to cook the steak and then I need to eat it. Right. So I've created a whole string of sub goals in order to achieve the, the meta goal. So human has a plan. Which has, it gets you to a sub goal and it has another plan, which gets you to the goal or, or any number of sub goals in the middle. So we can think back to our original goal for this lecture, right? What are we actually trying to do here? Well, we're trying to write applications that execute on crowds uh, of humans reaching an intended effect in the world. However, actually, I'm sure that for almost everyone here is a sub goal on the way to some more base fundamental goal that they have in life. And uh, maybe you can take a second to try and, uh, as you say, Work out what that is inside you. Like, what is it that's truly motivating you to be here? And that is, I suppose, where, um, yeah, where mechanism design, design lies in that space of creating sub goals. But we'll get to that in just a second. So, money and status are almost universally applicable sub goals on the way to reaching some larger goal that you have. So, in order for me to go home and eat a steak, then I, I, I need some money. Uh, not so much social status in, the, in this situation, but certainly money. And that means that we as mechanism designers can insert our programs in such a fashion that they output uh, some universally useful thing or universally useful sub goal for people, which will fit our mechanism design into part of the process of getting to whatever base goal it is that the human is looking for today in a very, very high uh, degree of likelihood. Kind of looks like this, right? Got the human, we got our mechanism, which gives the money, sometimes social status, depending, and we can get to that a little bit later. And then that gets them on the way to their goal. What's interesting here is that all of the humans in our crowd may have different goals, but money is a kind of universal, um, would you say, universal sub goal to such an extent that we can essentially uh, abstract away the complexities of the goal they're trying to get to. And now if our mechanism outputs this universal sub goal, money, then we can be confident that it's going to find its way into the planning structure of the human to get to their real goal, whatever that actually happens to be. So for me, it's going home and eating a steak, but for someone else, it's going on holiday somewhere or, you know, who knows what it is. There's all sorts of different goals that people want to get to. But the whole point is that money is such a universal thing that actually if we can provide that as an output from our mechanism, we can with a high degree of likelihood, expect people to take part in our mechanisms. OK, so now we can say but that by designing economic games uh, appropriately, we can force selfish humans to exhibit useful behaviors. And this, I'd say, is the crux of mechanism design. It's not really just about doing things that output money or making games that output money. That's not really the point. The point is to use that process to force selfish humans, so humans acting purely in their best uh, personal interest to perform socially useful behaviors. Kind of looks like this. So whole mass of humans get together. They're, they're uh, taking part in a mechanism um, which is producing money for them, which is a sub goal on the way to their goal. But we can see that because we define, uh, defined and sort of uh, designed or, or built our mechanism correctly, they are outputting some useful uh, side effect, if you will, from taking part in it. And so in the Arweave network, the useful side effect is um, replicating a data set of human history. But 
regardless of, you know, <laughs> for whatever application you're building, it's going to be a very different mechanism with a very different useful byproduct. But it really can be anything. The, the idea is to create economic games that reward people for uh, essentially achieving the thing that you wanted to achieve in the first place. But for them, it's just another step on the way to some meta goal, which is to some extent to us unimportant. It's, it's just that uh, a necessary component of incentivizing the human to take part in the game, essentially. Okay, example of this is bottle collection. So a mechanism designed where the, the government of a place has come along, this is, I think, in Berlin, or at least that's where I uh, got the image from. Um, yes, a mechanism designed where the government's come along and said, OK, wouldn't it be good if we had uh, fewer people on the streets with no jobs and cleaner streets? So what we can do is we can give people uh, a nominal amount, I think it's 30 cents in, in Berlin, um, for picking up a bottle and returning it to a recycling center. And so now they've got a generic mechanism where they're employing a large number of people as kind of base employment available to anyone without a contract. Um, and it has a useful byproduct. So the people taking part in the mechanism really just want the multiples of 30 cents, right? That's the money component. But the useful byproduct is that the streets are cleaner and more people have jobs, essentially, or at least some basic level of, of living standard achieved. Uh, a different component or a different sort of um, spin on the on the same mechanism design idea or space is, is that of the juicer economy. So at the beginning of the, um, I think we can we can say it, uh, clearly now that this was a bubble in retrospect. The beginning of the bubble um, in uh, electronic scooters in cities in the West. Uh, there was this problem that came about that basically the scooters would be in the right place in the morning, people would ride them to work, they would drop them off, they would massively centralize, they would run out of battery, and you you as the scooter company would have to come along and somehow redistribute them. This is actually a, a reformulation of the traveling salesman problem. So this idea that you have to um, plot a route around every scooter, which is pretty much randomly distributed around the city, you have to charge it, then you have to drop it in a useful place. And planning that route is actually very difficult. So what some of the, the first scooter companies did was they just sent vans around and they did their best to plan this route. Um, and, you know, the, there are heuristic algorithms for solving um, the traveling salesman problem now, such that basically you don't get a perfect solution, but you get a pretty good solution and it's quite low uh, computational cost. But, but they had this problem that, you know, you've got to scale up this operation of having you know, many, um, trucks basically go out and pick these things up and move them around. It's quite a complex logistical arrangement. And then the second wave came along and they were much smarter about it. They said, OK, well, instead of trying to solve the problem ourselves, why don't we build a mechanism which is going to output money for the players of the game, the crowd, if you will. And the useful byproduct will be that the scooters will be charged and in the right position. And then all they did was they defined if you um, if you take a scooter, you charge it, and you move it to somewhere useful, and these are defined in the app somewhere in some kind of interface, uh, we will pay you. And so this guy, and many people like him, came along and said, OK, sure, I can do that. And they used their you know, human ingenuity uh, and planning ability to solve the problem in a much more effective way. And then you can, you can make a tweak to this, which is even smarter, I would say which is to use the, the Bitcoin mining distribution system, which essentially pays people proportionately to some number of, in Bitcoin it's tokens, but like we can generalize, um, in some unit of value um, relative to their proportion of the work that is being done by the crowd. And this incentivizes more and more players to come to the game and to play it until the uh, value emitted per player is, is at, a sort of marginal level where it's, it's down to the reasonable profit that people accept. So it's a very useful way of getting to a, um, a fair value, really like a, a, an optimum price, essentially, for the work that you're doing. So in this case, it could be that, you know, Bird give out, I don't know how much it would be, like a thousand dollars a day or something to the players in this game. And then more and more people would come as they realized that the profit was very high. Uh, moving around the the bikes, uh, sorry, scooters, 
And you could give one point for every scooter that's moved. And so on the first day, you know, only like 20 scooters are moved. And so they have to send a van anyway. But by the 40th day, because the word has spread about this very effective and, and profitable thing to be doing, now like 2,000 scooters are being moved. And so for every uh, moved scooter, you're ending up getting like 50 cents or something like this. And this will continue. More people will be attracted to the mechanism over time until the point where it's essentially saturated. So you're paying a fair and reasonable price, a price at which no one will, um, you know, uh, no one will take part and and uh, be part of the mechanism if they receive a lower value. Uh, yes, you'll kind of find that price point using this mechanism in a very efficient way. So that's just an easy thing to apply in many, many different situations um, where mechanism design can be valuable. That That's like a useful, would you say, uh, uh, tidbit, I guess, is the word. Okay, so going back to uh, the idea of social status rather than uh, economic reward. Well, this is exactly what BitTorrent did. So BitTorrent essentially used this mechanism design we call optimistic tit for tat. It's actually very similar to what's used in the Arweave network today. And basically the principle is, if you give data to me, I will give data to you, and occasionally we give data to each other at random. And the Nash equilibrium, so where this game sort of tends towards uh, over the long term is everybody is sharing data with everybody else because of that kind of optimistic element. Um, and what's interesting is that there is no consensus in this game about reputation. People are just kind of scoring each other and they, uh, they keep their scores private. They don't need to expose them to anyone. They don't need to trust anyone else's scores about anyone else. They just have their own opinion about the world, if you will. Um, and essentially what you do by being a good citizen, so sharing data in this game, is you build social reputation. And that social reputation allows you to, um, yeah, take part in the game and download more data, essentially. So so if we're thinking about the, the structure before, the useful byproduct is, of this mechanism is that everybody is incentivized to share data freely, uh, or rather everyone is sharing data freely. So the mechanism is this optimistic tip for tack game, and the goal um, or the sub goal uh, that the humans are tending towards as players in this game is higher social reputation, allowing them to download more of whatever it is they want to download. And, and that's, you know, that fits into the human's desires to, uh, to download something. That's kind of the goal that they're heading for in this, in this game. OK, uh, final basic example of a mechanism design is, of course, Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has this proof of work system whereby miners are incentivized to uh, offer security to the network uh, by, uh, unfortunately, essentially guessing random numbers <laughs> and hashing them with potential candidate blocks and then seeing if they, the output solves some arbitrary game, which in this case is uh, difficulty. So if the output hash is less than some number. Um, and miners use this system to limit the... Uh, the production of blocks to some period, so every 10 minutes in the Bitcoin network. Um, yes, limit the production of blocks to once every uh, uh, 10 minutes, regardless of the number of miners that are taking part in the system. So it doesn't matter if you plug in you know, a million more machines to the, the Bitcoin network, they're still going to produce blocks at this uh, standardized rate. And everybody in this game is correctly incentivized to give their, their um, computing power to, to provide security and um, in doing so essentially secure this ledger. So that's the useful byproduct here. And of course, no surprise, the output of this uh, mechanism from the point of view of the individual is money, which is helping them, you know, who knows what they want to go buy. It's the universal or almost universal sub goal. So um, that is a kind of overview of what, what mechanism design is. Like one final way you can think about it is the inverse of game theory. So game theory looks at analyzing a game and seeing how it works mathematically. Mechanism designs the other way. It says, OK, well, if we wanted to achieve this useful byproduct, how would we set up our game? That is mechanism design. Ethics. Right, this is uh, Maurice Duplessis, if I'm uh, pronouncing his name correctly. He was governor of a, uh, a province in Canada think during the 20s or 30s, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's been a little while since I uh, <laughs> made these slides originally. Um, but yes, he was a governor and he noticed that the, the government 
of the, the sort of federal um, government in Canada was offering an incentive system that said that he received some number uh, of dollars, Canadian dollars, uh, for people each day that were in psychiatric wards and some number of dollars for children that were held in, um, they were essentially helped at least hopefully, in um, orphanages. And he realized that there was a, a massive disparity between these two numbers. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was $2 he was given per day uh, for people that were in um, orphanages and $7 per day for people that were um, housed in psychiatric care wards. And so what Maurice did was, which is truly awful, really hard to fathom, yet, yet um, unfortunately true, is he recategorized people that were in fact just orphans and put them into mental care institutions and in some cases even gave them uh, unnecessary psychiatric drugs in order to play the game to maximize the output from the um, uh, from the mechanism design that the government had set up. Now this is a this is an example of the dangers of the system. If, if you incentivize the wrong kind of behavior accidentally, there's no, no doubt that the Canadian government was trying to, you know, frankly, help the situation by offering subsidies for people, uh, for the, the provinces, um, you know, providing these services to people. They were clearly trying to help, but they got it. Uh, there was a bug, if you will, in their mechanism design, and the output was something absolutely catastrophic uh, for a large number of people. Now, at least this mechanism could be fixed. So they noticed this was a problem and they fixed the mechanism and they stopped incentivizing people to, to perform uh, anti-social behaviors, essentially. But, but it does go to show that the power of these things can, can potentially overpower, if you will, the, uh, the, mor the moral structures of the players inside the game or in, in the crowd. Um, that just goes to highlight you know, why it's so important that we really make sure that what we're incentivizing is ethically reasonable and correct. Um, in the decentralized protocol space, I think that the, the room for error is much, much larger. So in decentralized protocols, they enforce games that cannot be terminated or updated, rendering errors potentially fatal. So. I think the most obvious example of this is Bitcoin, which truly at this point, no single person on earth can change the Bitcoin algorithm or even a collective group of them. There will always be someone that says that Bitcoin is this machine as it's currently um, outlined. And one of the bugs in this machine, I would say, is that Bitcoin has a block size of one megabyte and it's never going to change. This was actually a uh, seemingly a rush job by Satoshi, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in 2011, the git commit message says something like, add one megabyte block limit, no further description needed or given. Um, I think there was some problem on the network that day and he was, or they uh, were trying to solve it. Um, and so they added this thing and it just became embedded in the rules of the network. And of course, there's this sort of perverse incentive where miners actually receive larger rewards if there's more congestion, because congestion forces people to bid on their place in, um, in their access to blocks, essentially. So if you know everybody else is busy bidding 20 bucks in order to get access to uh, putting a transaction into a block, if I uh, bid 21, my transaction is going to be prioritized. Mm -hmm. And so there's this weird perverse incentive that occurs that actually it might even be in the miner's favor to keep the blockchain less scalable because it means there's a high number of fees. So another way to think about that is that a larger proportion of the value being created by transaction in the blockchain is now being captured by the protocol and the people that maintain it. It's very hard to unglue those processes once they're in place. And nobody thinks that the Bitcoin blockchain could not, um, could not handle larger blocks than one megabyte. That much is, is simply off the table. It's just that there's no social consensus that we should increase it, potentially because people are incentivized not to increase it. Um, now, this bug in the game can never be corrected and it can never, and the game itself can never be terminated. And each individual player in the game, in the Bitcoin game, essentially, uh, is incentivized to sort of, well, frankly, hold the tokens because they think that the thing will increase in value going forward. 
there's a sort of quasi deflationary effect to Bitcoin in the end, as people start to lose access to their tokens and the number of tokens being minted um, you know, evens out. You can see that there's some, some sort of built in incentive to hold tokens because the scarcity of those tokens will increase. And when you do that, the game has become glued in society. You can't change it and you can't uh, you can't correct it and, and you can't expect it to disappear. The the players playing the selfish game are just not incentivized to stop playing. And this was again like a, a year ago. Um, energy consumption of uh, Bitcoin was just below or rather just above the energy consumption of Bulgaria at the time. So larger than um, I mean, it's 130 or 140 countries in the world. Uh, and today, I'm sure there's a much uh, higher number even still. And the problem is that the more scarce Bitcoin becomes, the higher the value becomes. And unless the amount of uh, tokens emitted by the system drops significantly, uh, and the problem with that is it's unlikely to happen because the, the fee market for access to blocks is likely to, as uh, prices rise, increase the, the fee component of block rewards to miners over time, then we can expect, you know, Bitcoin will essentially just gobble more and more energy. We can't stop it. It's processing the same stupid number of transactions per block. This is really stuck. This is a huge error in mechanism design. So I think that, that there's even more dangerous things afoot, potentially, if you combine these factors. So uh, that of um, human human morality being uh, overpowered potentially, um, and the fact that by these mechanism designs, and the fact that mechanism designs can't be altered after they're launched, and then you combine that with the fact that humans make errors, uh, I think that if you add it all together, you could get a catastrophic outcome. And, and one of those would look like um, artificial general intelligence built inside blockchain systems that you can't turn off and doesn't necessarily have human um, interests at heart. If you, you if you built this system, and I think for what it's worth, it would actually be remarkably easy to do using a system like SmartWeave because it essentially allows you to do arbitrary amounts of compute. If you built such a system, um, you may well be able to have, it may well have no realistic safety constraints that you would want with an artificial general intelligence. Um, and, and we just won't be able to turn it off. So you can imagine an artificial general intelligence, which I don't know if you guys have been watching what's happening with you know, GPT-3 and similar, but the, it does appear that we at least have created multi-domain intelligence in the AI field. And it's not clear how far that is of generalized intelligence. Like for example, GPT-3, pretty fascinatingly, is a, is a text um, transformer model, which is really just trying to work out how to, um, at the basic level, predict what the most appropriate next word should be in a sentence, kind of continuous string of text. Yet, if you ask it some mathematical questions, it actually does appear to have learned math to some basic degree, at least the, the you know, basic operators of arithmetic, like uh, addition, subtraction, and so on. It can do so to a fairly reasonable level. Um, it is quite staggering given that you know it was never intended to have that uh, if you will intelligence in that area so it's clear that there's multi domain intelligence already the the curve there if it continues in the ai space should lead us towards something that is hard to distinguish from artificial general intelligence in not such a distant future and if you were to decentralize that so make it so that there is no off button well this is like you know, all of those uh, um ai doomsday films rolled into one, and it uh, could be very, very, very dangerous. But this paper here um, outlined evidence that actually someone had already experimented with this, I think back in like 2015 or something, they found, um, uh, I think, an output from a cellular automata experiment inside the Bitcoin blockchain. But you can read the paper in your own time, it's quite interesting. Anyway, I think that if we don't get a, a grip on, on the ethical concerns in this area, um, yeah, we'll, we'll have many further dangers down the line that, frankly, I don't think are getting the attention they deserve in the in the um, in the wider press outside of crypto. Even inside crypto, I'm not sure people really realize what the uh, effects of these errors could be. 
Okay, so this is by no means a complete checklist, but you know, I, I felt I couldn't just give you this lecture which tells you what mechanism design is, how you can use it. So we're gonna get to that in a moment and why it's so dangerous without at least giving some vague uh, overview of things you might want to consider while or even before getting to the uh, getting to the point where you're designing a mechanism just as a tech check this something simple that that can be used to check that you're you're designing something reasonable um however i, I don't think this checklist is sufficient nor is it um complete what i would say though is is for the the only one I, I've seen out there. So it's at least a first approximation. I would obviously welcome input to this. So I think the first thing to consider when you're building a mechanism design is, is the mechanism fair? An argument for an unfair type of mechanism might be that of a uh, casino, for example. So a casino has a mechanism, uh, more or less, actually, where the house always wins and the, the players always over a long enough timeline lose. I would say that that, that is an, a mechanism that is not fair. Um, are the participants informed about the, the full rules of the mechanism they are taking part in? This is another important one so that people can make an informed decision. If you don't have this, um, then you have you know, potentially even worse outcomes for the people involved. And it's, it can't be seen as a reasonable you know, mechanism to, to put into the world, I don't think. Third component, are third parties negatively affected by the mechanism itself? And one, one argument could be um, that, well, the environment is negatively affected by Bitcoin and many, many people are you know, affected by negative effects on the environment. So arguably there are many third parties that are negatively affected by Bitcoin. Um, there's no hard and fast rule here. Uh, there's no, um, can't claim some kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> completeness to this, but I do think these are at least three basic things you can think about and three different framings of the problem that might highlight areas you should, should uh, consider carefully before um, moving forward when you're building a mechanism design. Okay, so all of that explained and um, kind of exemplified, I hope. Uh, we can now look at what you would do after you've sort of decided you want to build a mechanism design and you think that you know it satisfies all of those uh, components in order to be a reasonably ethical thing for you to be involved in building in the first place. How do you actually go about building it? I think it's a kind of five step process. So the first is you need to choose a byproduct that you're trying to incentivize. And this is a dangerous one. This is kind of like, um, you know, the, I think it's a ladding, the, the uh, story about the um, uh, genie that comes out of a bottle and the genie will give you precisely what you want nothing more nothing less and so the problem with using the genie becomes well specifying precisely enough what it is that you um desire uh is is very difficult and so people just stop using the genie if i'm not if i'm not mistaken well mechanism design is a bit like that you really get what you incentivize um and so choosing the byproduct like correctly and and with enough specificity is an important component uh Second thing, choose a reward, right? So what are you actually going to give people for um, for taking part in the mechanism? And remember that this should be a sub goal on the way to one of their basic goals. And that means that if you have a crowd of people, there's going to be some number of them that are activated by the mechanism that will likely be proportionate to the magnitude and the usefulness of the reward you're giving. So it needs to fit into the process there. And of course, that's going to create the byproduct, which hopefully you've well specified enough. Third component, choose a reward function. So this is a kind of um, an allocation rule, you could call it. How are you going to distribute the rewards that you have to the different people that are playing your game? Um, four, you build it, that one's easy enough. Um, five, you distribute word of the existence of the mechanism design in the first place. Now, some mechanism designs have a sort of viral loop, if you will, built into them. So each individual player will, uh, by the nature of playing the game, incentivize, or rather, yeah, inform at least one other player that will start to play the game um, as part of the process itself. And those are the those are the most effective mechanism designs. We can get to an example of that. It didn't last. Um, but one way or another, you have to make sure that you have some way that people are going to uh, hear about it. You wouldn't believe how many 
mechanism designs I've seen in the space um, where, yeah, people have built like an excellent design. It, it's ethically reasonable and it achieves what they want. The pie product is well specified. The reward is well specified and the, the reward function is, is clear. Everything's great, but they forget to tell people about it. And so nothing happens. So obviously you need to make sure that the distribution process uh, works too. Now let's go through a, a real example. So uh, Phil is one of the founders of the, or rather the founder of the R Drive project. R Drive is a permanent decentralized block Dropbox built on top of Arweave. They wanted to create a way of getting staked R Drive users. So people that have used the R Drive um, application and also own a small stake in its governance and its uh, future profits um, such that they would kind of stick around and engage with them, be its community in some form. Okay, they specify the byproduct, and this is essentially uh, it quite well specified, I would say, in, in the case of R Drive, right? You want users that are onboarded to the system, so they have to prove that they've used the system, and then you want them to have some kind of stake. That's it. And that is precisely for what it's worth, uh, what R Drive got from the output of their mechanism. So choose a reward. Well, R Drive tokens, because this sort of helps us uh, solve the, the first question as well, like uh, incentivizing people or rather getting people staked in. The great way to do that is to give them ownership, small amount of the protocol or application that you're building on top of the network. Choose a reward function. This is a very simple um, uh, proportional usage rule. So the data that a user uploaded in a given day divided by the total data uploaded uh, in that day, multiplied by the number of tokens that were going to be rewarded uh, or given in total, gives you how much that user gets. So, you know, if they upload 10% of the total data from that day, they end up getting 10% of the daily reward. Um, important thing to note here is that by using a mechanism like this, which is, I would argue, kind of similar to the, um, the Bitcoin proportional allocation rule that we discussed earlier in the slides, um, you can easily constrain the effective cost of the mechanism to you. If, however, you said for every person that uploads a piece of data on a given day, I will give them 10 R drive tokens, then there might be millions of people using your uh, application in that day, or there might be one person, and you can't really budget how many tokens are going to have to be given out to those people. So this is a way of kind of cost constraining it by making it proportionate to the number that you wanted to distribute anyway. It also has a weird but somehow uh, useful byproduct that uh, you over incentivize things at the beginning. So people come along and they're like, wow, I only uploaded like three megabytes, but I got, you know, I don't know how, what a, a large number of R drive tokens is, is because I'm not, not sure of the price, but 100,000 R drive tokens or something. That's amazing. And then they go and tell their friends. <laughs> And this does part five for you a little bit, this distribution, right? So, so if you over incentivize stuff, people tend to be amazed and they tend to tell other people, which brings more people to the mechanism, which pushes down the, the level of amazement and also over incentivization until you reach that point I was describing where the, uh, the mechanism has reached its optimal pricing per activity. Okay. In order to build it, uh, Phil used a system called Astatine, which was created by the Verto uh, founders. It's a very simple mechanism, which actually uses, I think, um, I think you can run any JavaScript environment on some kind of cron job, uh, but you can also deploy it uh, as a GitHub action, which is super centralized, but it's, it's <laughs> very basic and it works. Um, yes, to, to essentially just distribute the rewards like this, they have a whole framework where you, you know, put in a wallet that has the tokens inside, you specify what reward today should be, you specify how that curve uh, might decay over time, and that's why it's called astatine, it's kind of like a radioactive decay uh, type function. Um, yes, and it'll just distribute the reward for you, very, very, very simply. And then distribute, how do you distribute the message about the mechanism to people? So they did so on Twitter, Medium, and the uh, Discord service, and this was really effective, and it actually onboarded, I think now they, they already passed the thousand user line or something like this uh, of state R drive participants. And that's really cool because now those people are incentivized to go out and tell others about R drive. And when they have a need for permanent data storage, they go to R drive to store their data because they've used the system and they like the system. So it's kind of 
achieved its goal in that in that way. And if we put that back into the model that we discussed at the beginning uh, of this, I guess, talk, you can see that the human uses the mechanism which is described in this astatine program uh, in order to get R drive tokens, which are you know some sub goal on the way to personal goals. Because of course, R drive tokens at some point can be monetized for money, which is almost a universal incentivize or universal sub goal on the way to wherever it is they personally want to go. Um, and the useful byproduct, of course, is R drive initiation. So now they are a staked in R drive user who's initiated, knows how to use the system. Uh, I might even tell others about it as well. They're community members, essentially. Now, this is this is pretty interesting. Um, going back to that idea of the best mechanisms being mechanisms that spread themselves as part of the process. Let's look at our verify instead. So our verify is they call it the uh, the blue tick for the perma web. Like on Twitter, you have this blue tick system that shows you uh, validated or verified users. And Twitter, just in this totally centralized way, and it's actually pretty nepotistic. It's like, who knows the Twitter developers? Um, <laughs> they, uh, yes, they they verify people. Well, our verify is a solution to that using, uh, in a decentralized way, using a page rank like algorithm. So basically, people have an R verify score, and when they R verify other people, they um, give some multiple of their own score to that person to some extent, or at least they duplicate it. And so using the, the page rank algorithm, which was created by Google to uh, make civil resistant uh, search rankings, you can you can kind of spread this rank across a network of users. And so the more people uh, are verify you, the higher the likelihood the system is to give you the blue tick, tick and to believe that you are a human. Now, they made this really elegant mechanism design where they gave R verify tokens to people for having more R verifications. Um, and <laughs> of course, what that looks like in practice is that, okay, so the human uses this astatine, again, same same program to, to encode their mechanism, um, this astatine program to gain uh, R verify tokens, which is a, a kind of sub goal on the way to some higher personal goal. Uh, the useful byproduct that they're creating as a group is this web of trust. So who trusts who um, in the system? But uh, another kind of byproduct, which is um, useful and effective for the mechanism, is there's lots of people going out there and tweeting, hey, please R verify me. And this leads to more humans joining the game and taking part in the mechanism design, leading to a stronger web of trust or a larger web of trust and um, more R verification tweets. And you can then model this with a um, essentially an activation probability of each uh, human that goes through the, I guess, the, the process. So each human exposed to the mechanism design in the first place, there's probably like a 20% conversion or something like this. And you can get the, the hard numbers on this um, if you want, you can start to measure them. So 20% of people are converted to take part in the mechanism when they first encounter it, right? Of those people that take part, 0.3% say, um, send a tweet that says that, you know, please I'll verify me. Okay, and then the next step, actually approximately 2.3 people on average see that tweet and are again exposed to the uh, mechanism. And you can sort of model this through. And what's really interesting is that just by um, looking at it from this sort of uh, uh, componentized uh, sort of position, like a high level position looking down on the basic actions of each of the individuals in the system, you can, you can realize whether your mechanism is uh, viral or not. Because if it's viral, it'll essentially have, you know, more than one person coming out back to this human component right here at the start. Um, for each person that goes through it. And if you have that, just like, you know, unfortunately, the spread of viruses in our society, as we've seen over the last year, uh, that R0, if you will, if it's above one, will just tend to more and more and more people taking part in the mechanism, in this case, outputting a higher quality web of trust for no more R verify tokens because they've got this um, uh, proportional reward function that we spoke about. Um, yes, and with no marketing spend. And this, I guess, is like the archetypal example of how powerful these mechanism designs can be in practice if you build them carefully. 
Yes, and I guess here is the, the critical component. So again, just making this proportional will control your costs, but that's a kind of side point. And then reward today, you can make exponentially decaying. And if you do those two things together, it means that you can put aside a budget, if you will. So in Bitcoin, this is there will never be more than 21 million tokens minted by this mechanism. You have this budget, um, yes, which will never be exceeded. And, and so you can, uh, yeah. in Bitcoin, it's all the tokens, but in your mechanisms, in, in your Web3 applications, they could be 1% of the tokens, probably or half a percent or 10%. It doesn't matter. It's all up to you. But you can plan based on that. And that's the powerful part. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, hopefully that was a useful introduction to the space of mechanism design. And maybe by the end, it's kind of clear how you can use this in your own applications. And I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on the agenda, we have a, um, a talk typically about, uh, yeah, how to build these reward programs in practice for your applications. So when you look at, you know, I'm building, for example, a, uh, a blogging application. How do I make it so that I build effective mechanism design components into this in order to push the adoption of my application in, of course, an ethical way? Um, yeah, so I look forward to chatting to you all about that. And I'm also super open to feedback about this um, and input. Like we can make the next session essentially a reaction session if people want, uh, covering all of the pieces here that we didn't get to um, in a more uh, honed way to, to what people actually want to hear about. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, hope to chat to you in the uh, coffee and mingle section just out there. See you there.